Hey everyone, uh, Dr. Jack Audie here, and today I'm going to be taking you through uh, one more technique that is called the Eliza Spot technique. Very clever name because it's a mixture between an Eliza, but it creates spots. So they call it an Eliza Spot. Very clever name. Um, but what the Eliza Spot does is it solves a particular kind of problem, right? So in your white blood cells, you will have T cells and B cells and monocytes and neutrophils. And only a small fraction of those cells are T cells, and only a small fraction of those T cells will express the correct T cell receptor to identify an antigen that you are interested in. Now, that subpopulation of a subpopulation of a subpopulation means that you are not going to be able to do a traditional ELISA to look at the activation of that T cell because that T cell won't produce enough cytokine for you to measure in that growth media. So normally you might, let's say you were measuring IL-6, right? IL-6 is an inflammatory cytokine, it's pumped out. So we take the white blood cells, we pop them in a dish, we treat them with LPS, which is a, a PAMP, a pathogen associated molecular pattern um, that will bind to the TLR4 receptor on the monocytes and on the neutrophils and those monocytes and neutrophils will pump out IL-6, right? And we will end up with tens of thousands of picograms of IL-6 in our growth media, which is well within the detection limits of an ELISA, right? So then we can just run an ELISA on IL-6. If we wanted to look at, say, interferon gamma being produced by T cells in response to a specific antigen, because we had that subpopulation of a subpopulation of a subpopulation of T cells will express enough, will have the TCR that will recognize that antigen, the T cell receptor that will recognize the antigen, they are going to pump out only a very tiny amount of uh, interferon gamma. And so uh, we're going to uh, not know, uh, we're not going to be able to measure that amount of interferon gamma in the growth media. So how do we get around this, right? And this is where the Eli spot comes into it. So let me just take it through you step by step and how it gets around this problem. So Eli spot. Okay, Eli spot can be done a number of ways, but this one we're going to do inside a well. So just like the last ones, the Elizas and everything like that, we are going to look at a well horizontally. I've made it a bit bigger, and you'll see why soon. Okay. Now, this is again a magical special kind of plastic that's sticky to proteins, right? And what we put in here is where it already differs a little bit. It's quite similar to the sandwich Eliza in this case. In here, we put in a solution that contains an antibody that will bind to our interferon gamma. Now, I know antibody, the word's been chucked around a lot, but this is an antibody that we've taken from an animal. Um, or it could be um, from cell culture now, because now we've got cell culture techniques to produce an antibody. But let's say um, we take human interferon gamma, we inject it into a mouse, the mouse will have an, an immune response to that human interferon, because it's not mouse, and it will produce antibodies that will bind to human interferon. We then take those antibodies out of the mouse, and now we've got an antibody that will bind to interferon gamma, for example. So we then put those antibodies in here. Boop, boop, boop. I should draw faster than this, but I kind of want to make it neat. Here we go. Here we go. So these are mouse antibodies that will bind to human interferon gamma. Now, they have stuck to the plastic because it's special sticky plastic. And again, we want to block it, right? So we want to, once once our antibodies have stuck to the plastic, we want to get rid of the stickiness of the plastic. So we put in bovine albumin, that protein that comes from the blood of cows. Um, and this is just a protein that does nothing, but all it will do, it does nothing in this assay. It obviously does stuff in the cow, <laughs> but it does nothing in this assay, but it just coats the stickiness. So now the plastic isn't sticky it's like getting dust on your cellar tape it gets rid of the stickiness of it okay so that's what's happened here what do we do next next we create uh next we extract the pbmc's peripheral blood mononuclear cells so um pbmc's I'll type that out here p b m c's now they're called mononuclear cells because their nucleus is sort of in one sphere. It's not that other cells have more than one nuclei, it's that um, 
these cells have the nuclei in a sphere. Now that is different to the granular sites which have lobular, um, that have lobular, where's my blue pen? My blue pen. Yeah. Okay, so a neutrophil, for example, here's a neutrophil, it has a lobular. Boo, boo, boo. It has a nucleus like that, and that's, um, so it can fit through very tight gaps in the endothelia. That's a neutrophil. It is not a mononucleated cell. There are a number of mononucleated cells, and they all pretty much look like this. <laughs> But the most important ones are for this assay the monocyte and the T helper cell. Now, obviously, there's also cytotoxic T cells and B cells, but these are the two, um, two ones that we were interested in today. So, we take out a human's blood and we basically use a gradient. Um, for various reasons, but we can use what's um, called a density gradient, which is the idea that certain cells will float and certain cells will sink at a certain density of solution, right? And so um, uh, in this case, we're taking mononucleated cells that have a particular density, and so we can separate them based on their density away from the granular sites and the erythrocytes. I've got another video on that one if you want to check that one out. So we take out our PBMCs. Now, importantly, PBMCs will contain a monocyte, and monocytes can antigen present, right? So they have MAC2, and they can present the antigens. They are professional antigen-presenting cells. Um, then we have the T helper cell, and they contain the T cell receptor. So we've got a mixture of those two cells. What I'm going to do is I will draw the monocyte in green and the T cell in blue. So um, what we then do, and this is where it gets peculiar. This is where it gets crazy. I love this. This is where it gets crazy. We put the cells into the ELISA plate, right? And that's very unusual. Normally we have the cells in, in a growth media plate. We take the media off and we run an ELISA on it. In the ELISA spot, we put the cells into the coated plate. So here we have a monocyte. Uh, should I color them in? No, I'm going to draw them like that. Monocyte. Monocyte, monocyte, monocyte. Boom. There we've got a bunch of monocytes. Now I'm going to draw in the T helper cells. We've got a T helper cell, T helper cell, T helper cell, T helper cell, T helper cell. Now we're going to put in, now we've got our cells, we're going to put in an antigen. We're going to put in um, the thing that we are interested in. Now, the question is, why are we doing all of this? Well, when we get exposed to a disease, say SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2 is covered in different kinds of antigens. A good classic one will be those spike proteins on the surface of SARS. Um, we will have an adaptive immune response to that in which uh, a T cell that contains a T cell receptor that can recognize the SARS-CoV-2 protein will proliferate. And so... Many of our T cells, not all of them, but many of them in our blood, will now be the T cell that has divided and divided and divided because it, because it is the T cell that can recognize the spike protein. We want to know how many of our cells are those T cells. Have we managed to induce a good number of T cells that, um, that have the TCR that can recognize the spike protein? Why would we want to do that? to see if our vaccine worked, right? So if we inject a, a person with a vaccine that we hope will um, create a whole bunch of memory T cells for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we then would hope that there's a bunch of T cells floating around the blood of that patient that contain a T cell receptor that can recognize the spike protein, if our vaccine worked. If our vaccine didn't work, we would have very few or no memory T cells, T helper cells, floating around their blood with the receptor that can recognize that spike protein. So we've got these PBMCs, and in this case, we've got these PBMCs from someone who was vaccinated against the SARS-CoV-2 virus, right? What we then do is we pop in the spike protein. 
So we've got recombinant spike protein. So these might have been produced by a genetically modified bacteria to produce the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. We're going to pop it in. And what's going to happen is the monocytes, the guys in green, are going to phagocytose. Let me just start labeling this guy up. Monocyte. And then we have monocyte. Then we have the helper cell. And then we have the spike protein. So what's going to happen is the monocytes are going to gobble up. I'm going to draw this down here now. So the monocytes, there's the nuclei. They are going to, here's the spike protein. Boop, boop, boop. You might be wondering what all those red lines are about. Okay, so the spike protein is going to get phagocytosed. Right, so the uh, the monocyte is going to eat the spike protein. That's going to, the the phagosome is going to fuse with the lysosome, which is going to smash the virus uh, the the protein into bits, um, smaller fragments, and then those fragments are going to bind in the Golgi onto an MHC two protein, right? And then that fragment, I'm going to draw that here. Actually, I'm going to draw that over here. Let's draw that over here. So here is an MHC2 uh, protein, and here is a fragment of a peptide, right? So the monocyte um, here has eaten the spike protein, phagocytosed, it's fused with the lysosome, it's been digested, then on the Golgi, it will get mounted onto an MHC2 molecule, and then that vesicle will then go fuse with the membrane uh, to uh, be displayed. So this is MHC2 right so this is say the cell here do, 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 do. now that will be displayed i keep losing my pens here we go it'll get, be displayed and then we have a t cell t helper cell now we know it's a t helper cell because it has a cd4 molecule and a cd4 molecule uh, recognizes that MHC2 molecule, right? So the CD4 molecule goes, yep, that's a TAC2. So we are now going to bind to it. And this T cell will have a unique T cell receptor. Nothing is to scale, guys. <laughs> oh, nothing's to scale. And that T cell receptor, boop, boop, boom, T cell receptor, that T cell receptor will recognize the antigen on the spike protein the antigen on the mhc2 molecule this antigen came from the spike protein so if this t helper cell is one of those t helper cells that can recognize that antigen um it will detect it it will detect it and activate it and what will happen is we will get the release of interferon gamma right so if the tcr recognizes that antigen we're going to get the release of interferon gamma so in this case, this T helper cell will release interferon gamma. And remember, these antibodies are the antibodies that bind to interferon gamma. So as soon as they're released, it, they will bind to uh, the antibody. And what's great about that is we now get a physical location for where this T cell was activated. So um, there will be loads of antibodies. Again, this isn't to scale under those two cells. And that cell will release the interferon and it will immediately go down and get captured by the antibody. Now, this T cell might have a different T cell receptor. So even though the monocyte is displaying the spike antigen to this T helper cell, it's a different T helper cell. It's not from that clone. So its T cell receptor is different and doesn't recognize it. But perhaps this T helper cell is a clone of that T helper cell and was caused through proliferation of the master T helper cell that recognizes this antigen. So this guy also produces interferon gamma. Bum, bum, bum. Then what happens is we wash all of this out. So what happens next is we wash all of this out and all we're left with, all we're left with, whoa,
is the antibodies in this case and some of those antibodies will have um will have interferon attached to them some of them won't and what we then do is we go through the same process as we have previously right so we're going to use a detection antibody so this is another antibody that we've raised perhaps this was raised in a donkey or in a goat for example and this antibody is for human interferon as well and attached to this antibody is an hrp enzyme horse radish peroxidase h r p and then we can do a standard colorless substrate this one's a bit different though So this time the colorless substrate will be turned into an insoluble um an insoluble product right say this bright blue thing right here and this will sit on the bottom of the well okay so now let's have a look at what this well looks like from the top so the hrp creates an insoluble um colored product right an insoluble colored, colored product so in an eliza um, normally the whole well will turn yellow for example in a regular sandwich eliza the whole well will turn yellow and that's because the sub the product that's produced from hrp um the product that's produced from hrp will be soluble so it'll be yellow and it'll be soluble in the liquid so it will turn the whole well yellow in this case we've got an insoluble colored product so if this is an unvaccinated person and this is a vaccinated person in the vaccinated person we would expect a lot of t-cells a good proportion of the t-cells floating around the body to recognize the spike protein that we put on there so then we would expect them to produce a lot of interferon we would expect the interferon to be captured by the antibodies and then we would expect that to cause um uh, detection antibody to cause hrp to cause the substrate to be produced and so what do we end up with we end up with spots this is why it's called an alive spot and each spot pretty much corresponds to one successful activation of a t-cell through a monocyte displaying that antibody and so we might end up with results that look like this we end up with a well now we're looking at the wells from the top rather than from the side so this one's from the top an unvaccinated person perhaps there was a background signal there or perhaps we did capture one t-cell that could recognize the spike protein unlikely but maybe um, but uh, the vaccinated person has loads of T-cells, each of them releasing interferon. The interferon is immediately captured. So we get this local spatial information about which T-cell was the one that got um, activated from the monocytes. And so the interferon is immediately captured. We then put a detection antibody on there, which has an HRP. This HRP turns a colorless substrate into a colored precipitate because it's not soluble it falls out of solution and it nestles right where the um right where the t-cell was so if we scroll back here here's the t-cell that was activated and produced interferon gamma and here is a blue spot detected um, by the detection antibody which had an hrp attached to it and so the colorless substrate was then processed into a colored dot so we end up with lots of dots which represent interferon gamma producing t-cells which represent T helper cells that had a T cell receptor that recognized the um, that recognized the uh, antigen that we put in there, which was spike protein, right? So we can see here the vaccinated person has T cells that recognize the spike protein. So vaccination worked. Boom. That's the alive spot. Thanks, guys.